Play ball. Hey, doing baseball fans, and welcome to another edition of the Brushback with JP Rashardi. I'm John Arizzi with the dog days of August upon us. The weather is hot, and so are some major league players who are doing some amazing things this season. And even hotter are some of the pennant races, especially in the wild card brackets, to discuss this and more. Former GM, former front office executive, now broadcaster, podcaster, and analyst. JP Rashardi. Welcome back to another brushback, JP. Hey, John. How you doing? I am good. I just got back from New York last night. So I was there for the five, six days and uh, back here. Did some great things for Tunnel the Towers up there with uh, Paul O'Neill and had a meeting with Mariano Rivera. So yeah, it was a busy week, uh, but I'm back here. I'm ready to take on baseball today with you. Yeah, looking forward to it. Let's get into it. Yeah, let's do it. And uh, before we get to the hot takes, I do want to say that coming up, you have a very interesting guest on today's show. Yeah, we do. We have Kevin Lester, who was a uh, played a small part in the movie The Natural, a very important part. Uh, but more importantly, was the guy who worked with Robert Redford, helping him to get ready to play a everyday player in the movie. He's got some really interesting stories about The Natural, which was shot shot in Buffalo, New York, where he's from. And uh, it's kind of a fun piece, so I think people are going to really like it. Yeah, I can't wait to get into it, uh, but let's get right into this week's Hot Takes, brought to you by Percy's Appliance Outlet, featuring brand name appliances at up to 80% off regular retail prices. They are Worcester's largest dealer of home appliances and electronics, serving Worcester for over 80 years. And this is it. This weekend, it's the huge tax-free weekend coming up. August 10th and 11th, there are huge deals to be had, including up to 60 months of no interest financing in the mattress gallery. There is no interest financing on appliances, plus so much more. Go to percys.com and check out their tax-free guide for all the details, or give them a call, 508-438-6800. Don't miss the big tax-free weekend at Percy's, taking place August 10th and 11th. All right, JP, hot take number one uh, today. Uh, There are amazing things happening right now with one Aaron Judge. Another historic season is unfolding for the Yankees, number 99, with 41 homers, 104 RBIs, 324 average, and an OPS of 1.154. Who's better than the Judge of the Bronx right now? Well, you know what's funny? Remember in April they were ready to, to string him up because he was off to such a slow start? Uh, And that's the great thing about baseball. The other great thing about baseball is, you know, Judge is having an amazing year, an MVP type year. But why can Aaron Judge be a 300 hitter with plus power and on base and, and other guys are hitting 210 and 220 and we're raving about what their exit velocity is, we're raving about their power, we're raving about this. Aaron Judge is the complete player. He's what Kyle Yastrzemski and Jim Rice and Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays, he's what those guys used to be. He makes contact, he hits for average, and he hits for power. That's the complete player. That's the player who stands out in our game so much today because of – they talk about the, the three true outcomes, walks, uh, home runs, and uh, strikeouts. Well – Aaron Judge is getting on base because he's hitting, and not only he's hitting for average, he's hitting for power, he's walking, he's doing all those other things. To me, he's an absolute throwback to what great players used to be like. Absolutely. Uh, and he's just remarkable to watch. He really is. Uh, do you think he's got a shot of breaking 60 home runs again this year? You know, it's funny. I was looking at the game. I was watching him play last night, and I was looking at his numbers. I was like, you know, it's only it's only early August. You know, if he can hit – 10 this month, he's into the 50s. And then, you know, it's it's just a hot September that can get him there. Probably the, the odds are against him, but I, I think it's a safe bet to say that he's going to be in the 50s or the mid-50s again. So he's just having an amazing year. He He's having the year that those guys I mentioned earlier used to have. That, to me, is the complete player. And, and you know, I just get a little disappointed. We rave about these guys who hit 210 with, with 30 home runs and this and – Aaron Judge is the complete offensive player. JP, aside from Judge, who are the MVP candidates of each league right now? 
Well, I think Judge is the clear-cut winner right now, although Soto's having a great year, his his teammate. Um, I, I think in the National League, the one guy who jumps out me is Lindor. Lindor's had a great year. He's carrying the Mets. Uh, he's he's doing amazing things. Um, obviously, Otani has had an amazing year as well. Uh, and I think for some reason, it always seems to be the MVPs that determine what happens in September. So I think it's going to be interesting to see if someone comes out of nowhere and has an amazing September and pushes themselves to the front of the list. But I think some of the guys we, we mentioned earlier are guys, you know, Bobby Witt's going to get some some consideration for what he's doing in Kansas City. And I'm sure there are other guys that off the top of my head I'm not thinking. But the true test is how they push through in September. Yeah, and, and Lindor, when you mention his name, of course, uh, I think he has a better shot, obviously, if the Mets make it and get into the playoffs, which no one expected. But he leads Major League Baseball in war uh, since the end of May. And ironically, that's when uh, Carlos Mendoza, the Mets manager, uh, put him in the leadoff spot. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's just timing with a lot of these things. And I think with Lindor, you know, being at the front of the uh, the lineup, He's obviously getting extra at-bats, and he's probably a little bit more comfortable there. Um, but the Mets have had, the Mets are a good story. You know, they're, they're turning their, their season around. They're right in the mix of, the, of a, a playoff race. They've got a very tough schedule. I looked at their schedule. You know, a lot of trips out west, uh, you know, this time of year that can grind on a team. But, you know, listen, they paid Lindor a lot of money to go to New York and be a good player, and he's living up to it. So it's, it's good for the Mets. Yeah, it is. He's a very exciting uh, spark plug for that team, for sure. And as hot as the weather is, JP, some teams are very hot as well. Uh, Give us your hot takes on the teams creating the heat as we head into the middle of August. Well, I think you got to look at the National League West. The Diamondbacks are playing outstanding and the Padres are playing outstanding. And what it's creating there is it's putting a lot of pressure on the Dodgers. I think the Dodgers were at one point thinking that they were going to run away and hide. But that's not going to happen. And I think what you're going to see is two teams, the Diamondbacks being one and the Padres being the other, that are really not only going to push the the Dodgers for where they're going to end up, whether they win the division or not, but they're going to push each other to get that that last wildcard spot. So I think those two teams in the National League West, I think you got to think about the Red Sox are hanging in there, Kansas City's hanging in there. So those are the teams that when you look at the wild card, that they're really going to have a chance to – to put themselves in a position to make that to make that wild card spot, especially with that extra last uh, wild card being added. Oh yeah, that's uh, creating a lot of excitement. But you talk about the Diamondbacks. I mean, since the All Star break, the defending NL champs are twelve and four. If you go back to the week before the break, they're sixteen and five. And then you get to the Padres. The Padres and the D backs are three, just three games behind the Dodgers now, and they're both tied for the NL wild card spot, the number one slot. Padres yeah, are one you know, six. Yeah, you got to give AJ Preller credit because he he continues to make deals up to the trading deadline to make his team better. And you know, whatever you think about whatever organizations, there's some organizations that go for it, and there's some organizations that just teeter. And I think the fact that the Padres were willing to go for it, you know, it's a couple of things. Preller's in the last year of his contract. I think he wants to, you know, continue to be a GM. You know, but in all credit to AJ. He's tried to win everywhere, every year. And I give him a lot of credit for this year at the trading deadline stepping up. Oh, yeah. We'll be back with another hot take with JP after this word from Percy's Home Appliance Outlet. Percy's Appliance Outlet, next to our showroom on Gold Star Boulevard in Worcester. Featuring brand name appliances at up to 80% off regular retail price and come with manufacturer's warranties. Contractors and property managers save even more with volume discounts. Fast, professional delivery, removal and installation. Or bring your vehicle and pick it up the same day. Shop online with long-term financing available at percys.com. Percy's Appliance Outlet, first on Gold Star Boulevard in Worcester. Okay, JP, uh, one final hot take. Uh, there's an excellent four-part documentary on HBO Max right now about Pete Rose. It's called Charlie Hustle and the Matter of Pete Rose. Pete is the all-time MLB hits leader with 4,192 hits, but is also serving a lifetime banishment from the game because of betting on baseball. He was expelled in 1989, and now that he's 83 years old, there's a growing sentiment that he should go into the Hall of Fame because he's, you know, before he's no longer with us, 
What's your hot take on Rose? And did you see this documentary? I did see the documentary. I was a big Pete Rose fan as a as a young kid, watching him come up. Uh, obviously, one of the greatest hitters of our lifetime. I personally believe he should be in the Hall of Fame. I think every one of his records he accumulated, most of his records he accumulated because he was a player manager at the end. Uh, he accumulated as a player, and there, I don't believe there was any gambling associated with him as a player. I think all the the problem started when he was a manager. Uh, I think it's really hard to look at our game and see the guy with the most hits that isn't in the Hall of Fame. Uh, now, I don't know Pete Rose. I've never met Pete Rose. I've always admired him from afar. But when you watch the documentary, sometimes he's not the most contrite guy. And I think if he was a little bit more uh, of the ilk of saying, I did make a mistake, and I know he says it, but you you know you you just sometimes you look at it and say come on Pete you you can you can get in the Hall of Fame if you just really make yourself a, a little bit more endearing. But I got to tell you something yeah. that's interesting about Pete Rose. People say batting average doesn't matter today. Pete Rose, I believe, fifteen out of his first eighteen years in the big leagues hit over three hundred. Now, when people tell me that batting average doesn't matter. If you look at that, nine of those years, Pete Rose scored over 100 runs. So he got on base so Johnny Bench and Tony Perez could knock him in. He doesn't get on base if he's not hitting 300. And you don't score 100 runs if you're not on base. So when people tell you that batting average doesn't matter, I understand where they're coming from. But the argument for me is Pete Rose and Wade Boggs were continuous 300 hitters who scored 100 runs a season. A hundred runs is a lot of runs. That means someone else is knocking you in. And every time you go in a ballpark, there's a scoreboard. Those runs matter. So don't tell me batting average doesn't matter some somewhat. Well, uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But I agree with you. If he was a little bit more humble, a little bit more apologetic, and he did, in fact, lie, uh, saying initially he didn't bet on baseball, but he didn't bet as a player, Um yeah, uh, he's just uh, he just. But needs John, to be at in the some point, at some point, we have to look at McGuire, Sosa, uh, Clemens. Right. We have yes. to look at Bonds. We have to Bond. look at Pete Rose. We we have to say they're either all going to be in, or they're not going to be in. No matter what you decide to do, someone's going to be disappointed. But I just have a hard time looking at the Hall of Fame and saying these great players. Barry Bonds to me has to be one of the greatest players who ever played our game. For him not to be in the Hall of Fame, I think we're selling our game short. You know, I don't know if you have to put it. Ask, people know at this point, but there's a lot of guys who took steroids that aren't Hall of Fame players. I and, just think And there's that, a lot of guys that took steroids that are in the Hall of Fame. Exactly, exactly. So I think we're splitting hairs here. I think we should let all these guys in and then just go forward from here. I totally agree with you, JP. Well, thank you so much uh, for the hot takes. And uh, now it's time for Batter Up with JP, brought to you by the Worcester Bravehearts. And if uh, you are looking for affordable family fun, you've come to the right place. With the regular season now over, the Bravehearts are already planning for an exciting 2025. The four-time Futures Collegiate Baseball League champion Bravehearts want to thank everybody for coming out this season, and we'll be keeping you updated during the offseason on those activities and, and when you can start buying tickets for next year and all of that. So go ahead and follow the Bravehearts on Instagram, at Woo Baseball and go to WorcesterBraveheartsStore.com to get some Bravehearts merch, including caps, T-shirts, jerseys, and sweatshirts today. On today's Batter Up with JP, we have a guest that was heavily involved with the film many considered to be one of the best baseball movies ever, The Natural. Here to share those great stories and memories with JP, we welcome Kevin Lester. Kevin, welcome up to Batter Up with JP. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, Kev. How you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Good, good. So for, for our listeners out there, we're doing a little twist today, and we figured we'd have a little fun with the show and uh, bring in someone that was a part of, as John said, one of the most iconic baseball movies ever. And um, 
I can't, I don't know of anybody who doesn't know the natural in some way, shape and form. So our guest today is Kevin Lester, uh, former baseball player at St. Bonaventure, Uni St. Bonaventure University, home of the Big Dipper that you actually went to college with, Bob Lanier, for you yeah. basketball fans out there. You know, Kevin was a catcher in college. He ended up playing some semi-pro baseball after and was the bullpen catcher uh, for the Buffalo Club and the AAA Club for many years. Uh, and I believe at that time they were in the International League. Well, actually, when I start, uh, when we came into AAA, it was the American Association. American Association. And we jumped into the International League in the early 90s. And then Kevin went on to have a great career as a athletic director and a coach uh, up in that Western New York area, uh, Buffalo. And he scouted for uh, different clubs. And Murray Cook, a former general manager of the Expos, was uh, prominent in getting him into scouting. But what's bigger and better about Kevin is he was actually in the natural. And he's got a great story to tell. And we're going we're gonna to start off, obviously, by welcoming you. But asking you how it all started. And you got the original uniform on, right? I do. I got the, the Knights jersey. That's a keepsake. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so tell us how it all started. We, we, we'd love to know more about the baseball from your standpoint, but sure. this movie is unbelievable. So how did it start? JP, here's how it started. I, got, I was scouting for the Pittsburgh Pirates at the time. And I just got hired by Murray Cook in 82. And so we're starting, starting the spring season, looking at high school, college kids in, uh, in 83. And I get a call from my best friend, Duke McGuire. Duke McGuire, who had played in the Tigers organization, was now assistant general manager of the Buffalo Bisons. And he said, hey, some guy came to town, Melbourne, and they're looking at the stadium and they want to do a baseball movie. And they're looking for some help from some local people. And I said, what do you want from me? He said, I says, I'm, I'm teaching. I got the high school. I'm scouting. And he says, well, they're going to look for someone to get ball players together. And the fact that you're scouting, you're going to know a lot of people in the area and you played with a lot of these guys. So they want to hire you to do that. So I met with a guy named uh, Bob Colesbury, who was the assistant director and, uh, Mark Johnson was, was a producer and Barry Levinson was the director. Just, just great guys. And here's, they told me, look, we know what we're looking for as far as the look of old time, you know, an old time ball player. He says, but we want you to choose the ability you have as a scout, as a former player, you have a general idea what we're looking for as far as that athletic ability. And I says, okay, let's do it. So I, I'm making calls to former guys I played with, you know, where we had some open tryouts, uh, didn't go real well. So I'm getting a lot of my friends involved in this. So we're setting this up. We got it set up for about maybe a week, a week and a half. And I'm telling uh, Mark or Barry Levinson, here's why I believe this guy can do it. This guy can do it. And then uh, he says, well, we got some guys coming in from New York also. And I says, okay. And I says, do you have any former pros? And I said, uh, he says, well, we have a third, uh, former third baseman of the Mets. And I said, okay. I says, who's that? He says, well, we're not sure he's going to come yet, but we're hoping he does. I says, what's his name? And he said, Phil Mankowski. I looked at Barry Levinson and Mark Johnson. I said, I'll have him here tomorrow. They looked at me and says, how do you know this guy? And I says, he was my best man when I got married. <laughs> so right then and there, I make a connection with these guys. So I called Phil and I says, look, Duke and I are doing it. Joe Charbonneau's here. He's screwing around. We're doing it. Come on to town and let's do this. It's only going to be a month. Well, you know how that goes. It's, it, it lasted. I, well, we'll talk about that later. But anyways, I brought, we got those guys. We picked the team. I had uh, Barry Levinson and Mark Johnson say, okay, I think we have what we need. And I says, well, I got three guys here. I want uh, to take some batting practice. They're home run hitters. He says, oh, we got Ed Cranepool and Ron Swoboda coming in for that. And I says, well, these guys are here. Let's, let's let them at least hit. I put uh, Duke McGuire up there, left-handed hitter, small ballpark. He's putting them on the roof over there. I put Joe Charbonneau up there, center field. He's driving them out to center. I got a guy named Jim Mary I played with. He's hitting them out and left. And I turned to uh, Mark Johnson, the direct, the producer, and, and I, I says, what do you think? He said, you just saved me about $100,000. Well, so, and, and not to cut you off, but for the listeners, Joe Charbonneau, was the rookie of the year for the Cleveland Indians. 1980. Right. Yeah, he was amazing. 
he uh he had the reason he was in buffalo he was playing with uh we were with uh cleveland at the time as a minor league in in double a and uh he got released and um he we ended up he ended up playing with us locally am, with right. the amateur team so he we got him in the movie too so all the the players are picked i said here's my list let's go for it and they said we'll see you next week and i said for what he said well we want you to be on the nights and I'm thinking, man, I got to call Pittsburgh and see if I can work this out. So I called Pete Gibrian, my supervisor, and he said, go for it. What the hell? Chance of a lifetime. Do it. So I ended up being uh, the catcher on the nights. Um, I got involved in many different ways. Um, you know, I'm JP, I'm the type of guy that doesn't sit around. I talk to people and and we're, we're you know, things are going on. And uh, I got all these guys involved. And uh, all of a sudden, I got these guys coming to me. Hey, we've been standing here all day long, you know, six in the morning till six at night for $25 a day. This isn't going to work. So I went and talked to Mark Johnson. I said, these guys are ready to walk. Is there any way we can get them more money? He says, all right, we'll give them 75 a day. And I says, great. So I went and told the guys. They says, all right, we'll do it. The next paycheck comes. I'm getting 150 a day. And I'm thinking, Am I going to be the honest Catholic boy and go tell him they paid me wrong? <laughs> or do I just not say a word? I went and talked to the secretary, the payroll secretary, and I says, I think I think Mark made a mistake. I'm getting, you know, 150 a, a day. And she says, no, he said to make sure you get that. So right then and there, I'm thinking, okay, the guy likes me, and I'm going to do all I can. I'm going to do more than just, you know, stand around. First thing I did, the catcher's glove I had was – 1939. I didn't like it. So I added some leather because I always repaired my own gloves. I added some leather to the, the glove, uh, showed my buddy Phil Mankowski. He says, he's a third baseman. He says, I'm having trouble with this glove. Can you throw some leather strap? I says, yeah, give me the glove. I took it home, punched holes, put the leather in. Next day, the prop master, uh, Barry Bettig, who became a very close friend of mine, comes up and he says, he, he comes to Phil and he says, hey, where'd you get that glove with the laces on it? And he says, well, Kevin Lester made it for me. Oh, shit. So now <laughs> Barry comes to me. He says, did you fix, did you put leather in that glove for Mankowski? And I says, yeah. Is that all right? And he says, well, Redford wants his glove like that too. So now I go home I, and I do five of Redford's gloves. So let me back Let me back up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So when did you know Redford was going to be in the movie? And when did you first meet him? Well, we knew he was going to be in the movie right from the beginning. Okay. But he didn't show up for a while. There was a guy named uh, uh, Martin. It was uh, his stand-in, who, who was his stand-in for all these, for a lot of movies, was his stand-in. And he uh, he came, and he looked exactly, Greg Martin, he looked exactly like Redford. And we're thinking, is that Redford? Is that Redford? Well, then we find out it wasn't. Uh, so Redford came probably a few weeks later. And, and in between, I should tell you, they needed to set their cameras up. So they had myself, Duke McGuire, a guy named Steve Polyachek, unfortunately, passed away in Charbonneau at the stadium. And they're getting their cameras ready. So we're hitting, we're playing catch, we're running, we're sliding just to get their cameras lined up. So that's, so and we kept waiting for Redford to come. So Redford came uh, probably about three weeks into what we were doing. And uh, so, as I said, I get involved. And so now the prop master is giving me a retainer to repair the gloves, uh, catcher's equipment, <clears throat> whatever. OK, so um, as we're filming, <clears throat> got Caleb Deschanel is the cinematographer. This man is Zoe Deschanel's father. Uh, he's won several Academy Awards for movies he's done. One day I see him looking in the camera. And I go, what are you doing? And it's pointed towards right field, short right field. And I, I, he says, I'm trying to figure out how to get a ball in this frame. And the reason being, previously we tried an air cannon. We we tried a uh, like a 20 or 20 gallon propane tank. They pumped air into it. There was a release on it. It would shoot a ball, but the ball knuckles. It wasn't working. So I said, uh, he said, I'm trying to figure out how we can get the ball in the frame. And I looked and I says, well, I'll throw it. He says, what do you mean? I said, I'll stand behind the camera and I'll throw it where you want it. So now he said, well, if you can do it, I'll give you 20 bucks. Now Bob Colesbury, assistant director, comes up. 
Mark, Mark uh, Johnson, Barry Levinson, a couple other camera guys. What are you guys talking about? And he says, well, Kevin says he can get the ball in the frame for us. And he's guy said, and, and Caleb says, I'm going to give him 20 bucks. So now I got about $180 riding on this throw. <laughs> he says, he, I says, where do you want it? He says, I want it three rows above or three by, rows below, six seats left or right of the frame. First throw right there. He says, that's it. You're my guy from now on. So, but, so the rest of the movie, I'm throwing, Redford's catching a ball, I'm throwing it and stuff like that. Now, so now they're throwing in more. Now I got a $300 a week retainer for <laughs> just for that above my my pay for, for being in the movie. So they also, they had me in front of cameras with a catcher's mask, uh, a catcher's glove, and like a first baseman's glove protecting the $250,000 camera. Like I said, JP, I just got involved in, in all different things. And uh, on a daily basis, I was there, even if they didn't need me. Um, I traveled to California for six weeks with them at the end of the movie. But it um, it was great. Uh, Redford was outstanding. When he came, um, the only thing I didn't like when we first started playing Pepper with him, he was taking full swings. Oh, jeez. He didn't now, know. Redford, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think I've heard this somewhere. I think yeah. Redford played some baseball either in high school or junior college well, or something. There was an article in the Buffalo paper. He was being interviewed. And a reporter had asked him, he said, they asked him like three, like four or five questions at one time. You know, you ski, you hike, you play baseball at the University of Colorado, you do this and that. And he says, he says, well, I, I like being active. I like, you know, I like being in shape. I like being an athlete. So it goes in the paper that he played baseball at the University of Colorado. Well, all of a sudden we get a, they get some notice from some coach at Colorado. This guy never played baseball for us. Now that there's some negative things in the newspaper, you, you know how that goes. And, yeah. and we got to notice nobody talks to any press, you know, but he did, he, he had no trouble swinging. He, uh, matter of fact, I had him at our high school in the batting cage. Now I did not teach him to hit had a guy named Tony Ferrara. Did you know, Tony? Yeah. This is where yeah. Tony Ferrara was hired. Um, so I set up the school, I set up the batting cage and the pitching machine and actually, we didn't use the machine much. I did pitch to him just to give him the ability. And Tony was the guy actually t- trying to teach him how to hit. I would have told him a few different things, but <laughs> but he looked like it, he was trying to emulate Ted Williams. That's that's right. That's right. Because that's the the takeoff of it. Right. You know, natural. Was number number nine. So um, the first time you threw batting practice to to Robert Redford, did you say, okay, he's got a halfway decent swing? Or uh, he's got a horseshit swing. Bob, great job. Keep swinging. Great <laughs> job. <laughs> you don't tell the star you're not doing it right. No, I'm saying, did you no. say to yourself, this is a horseshit swing? No, I, no, I thought he was very good. I thought he was very good. I mean, yeah. you mentioned high school. I, he, play, he had to play in high school, you know, because he had a decent swing, nice left-handed swing. Even you when know, you watch he, him throw in that movie, he, he threw like he was he had played some. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yeah. And he caught some, he caught balls in the outfield. He was, uh, I don't think he would have, you know, but ever, ever been drafted, but he was a, a decent baseball high school athlete, you know, and which, which we all were back then. So did he hit every day? He, um, he liked hitting a lot. And here's another story. All of a sudden he picks up my bat and I always, I, I always, always ordered my bats from Louisville. It was a, I had a, a K55 handle, which was mantle, yep. MC44 top, bigger top. I figure I have a better chance of right. hitting the ball, right? Willie McCovey. So he's using my bat. <clears throat> so now we're into maybe mid-July or something, and uh, the prop master says to me, where do you get your bats from? And I said, I ordered them from Louisville Slugger. And he says, well, we have to get a dozen of them overnight. And I laughed, and I said, that's not going to happen. And it was right about the time when George Brett had the pine tar in his bat. All right, they took right. his bat, he was mad. I says, George Brett can't even get a bat overnight. And he says, we got a problem. We're filming Redford hitting tomorrow. He wants to use a bat like yours. And I said, right, let me see what I can do. So I took it home. I spent the whole night hand sanding the bat, hand sanding it. I took it in the next day. And the, uh, I don't know if you can see it, the artist put Wonder Boy on it. 
That's unbelievable. That's the yeah. original Wonder Boy? This is one of the originals. Wow. So the prop master says to me, I brought it in. He says, that's great. The artist will put Wonder Boy on it. He says, but we're going to need about a dozen more. And I go, Barry, it's not going to happen. I said, He says, do you have any more at home? And I says, I probably have three or four more. So I went home. I took them. I took them to the high school, put these on a lathe because I wasn't going to hand sand all night. Put them on a lathe and took sandpaper and just sanded them down nice and even, took them in, put Wonder Boy on them. The artist put Wonder Boy. And at the end of the movie, the prop master gave me three of these things. That's pretty they're, cool. They're very valuable. So um, the prop so master. Why, why, did they, why did they put Wonder Boy? What was the meaning of Wonder Boy? When, he, when uh, Roy Hobbs was a young man, uh, a tree struck, a uh, lightning struck a tree on his property. Right. And he went out and he, and he put, took a piece of wood and he hands, you know, hand chisel or uh, filed and everything and uh, chiseled and everything. And he made the bat as a young boy. Um, and he put wonder boy on it because it was struck by lightning. And if you, I right. don't know if you can see, but there's the lightning. Yeah. Scene. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's and, that's pretty uh, cool. when, when, uh, Wilford Brimley are the manager at the time, asked him, he says, you know, when after his first batting practice, hit some home runs and he, he picked up the bat and he says, let me see it. And he says, uh, Wonder Boy, huh? He says, what does that mean? He says, well, I, I made it when I was a young man. I mean, was, he says, what's the lightning bolt for? He says, well, the tree was struck by lightning and I wanted to make it from, from that tree. Yeah. And then as we know in the movie, he breaks Wonder Boy, right? He and does. He says, and he actually got to win a Bobby, right? Yep. And he hits the home run with a, a bat called uh, the Savoy Special. The Savoy Bobby Special. Bobby Savoy was the was the bat boy, and uh, it was uh, the bat was Savoy Special. <clears throat> you know, we're, we just mentioned Wilford Brimley. Some of the people in this movie were outstanding, and and they were so great to work with. Um, they did hire again. They hired me again to work with the. Uh, they had about twenty five left handed, blonde haired, blue eyed kids trying out for the movie to play Roy Hobbs when he was a young man. So they said, we're going to need you to help us find this kid. And uh, so there were three kids out they brought to the stadium and I right away picked one out and it's a kid named Paul Sullivan, left-handed, good looking, blue eyed, blonde haired kid. I said, I think that kid is one I would like to work with. So I spent many hours with him in the summer. He was a hockey player, probably only, 10 at the time or some 11 at the time, but I had him in my backyard, which I, I have a field in the backyard because my kids, it's a wiffle ball field, but we got a, a pitching rubber and a mound and everything home plate being a high school athletic director, I had access to that. <laughs> so I had Paul Sullivan over uh, many times working on pitching. He was an outstanding young man and uh, he got the job and uh, uh, it, it, just a great kid. Uh, other people, Robert Duvall, who played uh, Max Mercy, um, the newspaper man, outstanding. Every day, and I was with these people every day from late June till till December 21st. Again, I mentioned I was on all the call sheets. Um, Robert Duvall was great. Glenn Close, she came on the set. She was like a little sister to us. She wanted to, she threw, played and catch, played catch every day. She wanted a jersey. She wanted a hat. She wanted a team jacket. And we, you know, they gave it to her, of course. And she, she was just great to work with. Um, Kim Basinger, I didn't have much contact with Kim. She, she uh, was, uh, she played Memo, Memo, the uh, girl that Redford, that Roy Hobbs ended up with. But I mentioned Wilford Brimley earlier. Every Saturday, uh, we either were out on a boat called the Miss Buffalo and they had a band or we were at the hotel and they got a band and we were in the the ballroom dancing and having a party and everything. Wilford Brimley, unfortunately, had passed away recently also. Just so much fun. You see him out there dancing with Glenn Close and, and uh, Morgan Fairchild, who was the actress who was in a lot of uh, those drama, female drama movies. I think dynasty or whatever. She was on the set all the time because her boyfriend was one of the cinematographers and it was just great having those people around. I, I honestly think, I honestly think Morgan Fairchild might've been waiting to maybe cause if, if, 
if uh, Kim Basinger couldn't make it because she was doing a, a a James Bond film at the time. Okay. And uh, I was were thinking, any of these people were were like William Brumley, Wilfred Brumley. Uh, were they baseball fans? I mean, did they talk to you about baseball? Um, or were they casual baseball fans? They were casual baseball fans. Um, um, they asked a lot of questions. I, I, the, the guys I spent a lot of time with were Wilfred Brimley, uh, uh, Richard Fonsworth, who was a stuntman for all, all cowboy movies through the 30s and 40s. He played, he played uh, Red, the, the assistant couch. The, no, the, the main characters were not we, – we talked baseball, but they weren't great, ball, great baseball fans. Did you have to tell them like some baseball terminology? Like sometimes you hear these well, guys. Here's what I did. You know what I did? Um, when we started filming, they were looking for me. Um, Barry Levinson, the director, would ask me things. They were looking for me. So what I did, I got some old films. I, I it, you know, the VHS and so, VHS and everything. And I started looking at old baseball movies, anything I could find to see how guys carried themselves, how they, what they did with the, uh, the baseball gloves. They, they didn't always take them in. They left them on the field. They sleep on the field. Yeah. And how guys threw and how guys did that. And I'm thinking they're asking me these questions. I better have some answers. So I did as much research as I could. I went to the library, looked at old baseball books, looked at, uh, you know, how guys dress and stuff like that. So I spent a lot of time doing that. Barry Levinson was really great about all that. And uh, I will tell you this, Bob Colesbury, the assistant director, he had also passed away recently. He did something called The Wire. Uh, and he uh, he was a baseball guy. He he would ask me and we'd talk and I'd say we should do this. And, you know, and Tony Farrar was, at, was there for that also. Right. So Tony had some uh, say, and they brought um, Rick um, Cerrone. Oh, yeah, the catcher, the catcher, yeah. Yeah, not the catcher. Oh. The, who worked with... Uh, the Yankees that didn't he work for Cashman, Rick Cerrone? Oh, the um, the Rick Cerrone, the catcher, I know. Yeah, but there was another. He might have been a, a front office guy, right? And 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 Phil Rizzuto came when they were in when they were in uh, Toronto for games. Phil Rizzuto came in, you know, and and talked and everything like that because he was friends with Tony Ferrara. And uh, so the, the the movies, if you look at the movies, like if you go back. Um, and you think of like bang the drum slowly. Then you think of, I mean, you go way back. With yeah, William. I went way back. I That's went what I'm way saying. Back. When you think of William Bendix playing Babe Ruth, you think of all those old, uh, I think Rob, uh, Ronald Reagan was in one too. Right. But they were so phony yeah. that you're like, geez, that don't even look like anybody yeah. playing baseball. But the natural, and from there, that point on, it got closer and closer to actually looking right. like baseball. That's what I was basically charged to do. Barry Levin said, said, look, we know the look, but you're going to have to help us make sure that we have ability out there. Now, there was, I was disappointed in some of the play. We had some great people, some young, like uh, from, from uh, New York. Now, we did have some former uh, minor league players. We had a guy named Kenny Grisano, who was a pitcher. Um, we had Sibby Sisti. Oh yeah, uh, Sibby yeah. was a local guy. He was a Pirates manager. Um, let's see. We I'm trying to think some of the other uh, minor league guys that we had. A couple guys had a few. Uh, few. I'll think of a few names in a minute. But we we would talk and say, and I would say, you know, that I'd tell Barry Levinson, you know, back in 1939, that's not what that's not what happened. You know, right. we need to change it up. So he did rely on me for stuff like that. And you had um, to have players who. Whose physical stature right. looked like 1939, right. 1940 type players. Right. And and they were not all and I maybe that's why I was there, because I was not a, a, a you know one of those cut athletes. You weren't a Greek god. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was, you know, it's funny. I was watching Sports Center this morning. Some of these guys hitting home runs. I can't believe it. The yeah. bodies. But, so let but me anyway. ask you something about yeah. the is that uniform? Is that that's an original uniform, right? It is. Is that real wool? Oh yeah, Ugh. we we sweat, we sweat Ugh. like crazy. We had sweat so, like crazy. And most, these hats, most people don't. Most people that are listening to the show, back in the '30s and the '40s, and I gotta believe the '50s, the uniforms were made of wool. Yeah, they were so heavy. And the other thing I hated about them was 
they were itchy. Yeah. Really itchy. I couldn't handle that kind of wool, but that looks like it's a little bit more of a, of it's, a thinner wool. We, we sweat it a lot. Yeah. And you know, these hats. That's the original hat? That's one of the original hats. Yeah. And look at how they fit us. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> they, and these were falling off all the time. But um, the other, the other things were, uh, we wore the heavy, heavy wool jackets. Yeah. Too. And I do have one of those also. I didn't That's bring a little cool. But yeah. Um, but getting back to some of the other uh, uh, actors and everything, when Joe Don Baker, now they, like I said, I was with them every day. So when we, when we would go out, uh, we filmed the carnival scene in a south, place called South Dayton, New York. They had a, they set up a carnival. We had the old train there and everything. And that's where, that's where Roy Hobbs first strikes out the whammer. Right. So they asked me to work with Joe Don Baker. Now they even had, they had like a, a pitching cage there um, that you threw a ball and knock something down or something like that. So I had Joe Don Baker in the cage and they asked me, can you teach him how to hit? And I says, wait a minute. The original Walking Tall, this guy swung this big club. <laughs> it says it's going to be easy. Well, Joe Don Baker never played baseball. And he and you, if you see the movie, if you watch the movie, he he doesn't have a very good swing. Great guy and everything, but I and I just I tried get him to more of a comfortable swing and everything, and it it just I felt I failed because when you watch well, the movie, when, you know what you got to realize if you've never swung a bat in your life, yeah. Uh, it's it's yeah. you know I, I read something today that you could take a baseball player and put him in any other sport and he'll find a way to compete. Right. But you can't take those other athletes and have yeah. them hit a ninety five mile an hour fastball. So which is what you're trying to do get a get a guy who's never played to swing a bat. That's that's they're so uncomfortable yeah. and unorthodox when they swing. And you've you'll see a couple players in that movie if you watch it you'll see them. Um, there was. Uh, Another Michael Madsen who played Bump Bailey. Um, I guess he, you know, great actor in a lot of these uh, other films and everything. He wasn't much of an athlete, good guy. So when he went through the wall, um, it, <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't get it to work for him. You know, he dies going catching a ball going through right. the wall. So Bob Colesbury, the assistant uh, director, who, who I said was a a pretty good athlete. He, um, we used him. He dressed in Bump Bailey's uniform and the wall was, you know, the wall, we had hooked it up on top and it was going to give when he went through it. We had a crash, uh, crash pad that I got from the high school behind there. And I was the guy throwing the ball and I had to throw it just about, you know, just above the wall a little bit so we can catch it. Right. And he, and we tried it Mads, and it just wasn't going to work. You know, so but Bob Colesbury did uh, catch it and go through the wall, so, so <laughs> it looked pretty good. When when you, <laughs> I hope this doesn't come across as mean or anything, but like when you start playing catch with some of these guys, did you say, "Oh boy, this guy got no shot"? <laughs> well, I <laughs> and I was asked a few times, "Do you think that we can have him throw the ball?" from here to there. And I'd say, you might want to choose somebody else. <laughs> you know, I had to be very kind. Yeah. Um, but when we were, uh, I was going to tell you something. Oh, when we were in um, South Dayton doing filming the scene where Roy Hobbs uh, strikes out the whammer, they had to have it. And again, um, Caleb Deschanel, he was a, he was a profession perfectionist. It had to be, so we could get it in the camera. So I'm probably maybe 10 feet from now. I'm, it was supposed to be, um, Robert Duvall or not. Yeah. Robert Duvall, the, uh, the camera or the newspaper man, he was behind home plate catching when the whammer was batting. All right. In the film, you see that, but actually when Redford's throwing the ball, I'm, uh, I was doing the catching as he was throwing because it's has, he's not even thrown to a battery. He's just thrown to me. You know, that's right. how, fun, you know, I learned a lot in there. So then it comes to a time where um, we have to throw the ball and the catcher ha has to hold it right there, which would have been me. 
but now they can't get someone to throw the ball right there. So they take me out of uniform. They put Bob Colesbury, the uh, assistant director who had some baseball ability. He's there and I, and I'm maybe 10 feet away and I have to throw the ball. So the glove doesn't move left or right. I throw it. And they also want to see, I should have brought one of the balls. They want to be able to see the camera where it says Spalding. You know what right. I mean? Right. So we did a few takes. So I'm, I had, I'm throwing it almost like, I'm almost like right. long, not throwing, not spinning it, just yeah, pushing launching it. it. And I had to get it right into the glove. Couldn't go here. Couldn't go there. It had to go right there because that's where the camera was. And as those were little, little things that I did that they really appreciated. I believe that's why they took me to California. So I was the only one from Buffalo who went. Did you get to spend any time with Redford outside of baseball or did you guys get dinner? Did you, did, was he personable? He was, he was very personable for short amounts of time. Yeah. Because he was, you know, he was, I will tell you this. He was a total perfectionist. If he did a scene, he didn't like it. He, we're going to do this again. <clears throat> but the scene where we're visiting the judge uh, in his office and it's dark and, and Redford hits, turns the light on because the guy liked being in darkness and everything. We were in there. I was, I was in there a long time with him. So we did a lot of conversations and, and I, I was not the guy that said, give me your autograph. Tell me about this. Tell right, me about right, that. Right. But standing next to him several times and talking, you know, again, JP, I'm the guy that talks to anybody. I'd ask him, I said, Bob, what was your favorite movie? He told me the great Waldo Pepper. Really? He flew. He, he said he flew the biplane. Not for most of the movie, but he does fly one. Right. He said, and he told me that was the movie he liked the most. I talked to him about his family, talked to him about skiing. Uh, did uh, You know, we talked baseball, but I did not. I, I never asked him for people says, can you get his autograph? I didn't, I didn't no, do that. I didn't no, want to no. be that guy. But you found that you found he was a regular guy. He was a regular guy. 100%. Right. Matter right. of fact, one day we're in, uh, we're in this small, it's a, what we're using was a, uh, I guess they call him a, a set, a, a, a movie set that was made to look like the judge's office. And it was pretty small. And we had about eight people in there and I'm thinking, how are we going to do this? So I'm standing off to the side and, we were not filming yet. And I was going to take a picture of something. And he, he says, Kevin, Kevin, I saw, okay, Bob, I'm sorry. He said, no, no, the, the lens camera is on the, the, oh. the, the camera. The, the lens is covered. I said, okay, he said, you can take all the pictures you want, but make sure you know how to use that camera. So we had a good laugh. So my, I get the call after we're done filming the movie, I get a call from his secretary and it says, um, we have flight arrangements uh, for you and your wife, this date and everything. And I go, for what? He says, we want you to, we're going to film in, in L.A. for about a week. So I says, okay, we got my, my mother-in-law to watch the kids. Uh, this, you know, I take a leave of absence for a little while from school. Um, we get on a plane, we get off. There's a guy holding a sign, the Natural Movie Company, takes us in a limo to, uh, uh, it was uh, Culver City. Uh, Laird Studios, where they filmed all these old movies years ago, these si- silent movies in Culver City. We get out of the car. There's two Porsches flying around this parking lot. I mean, what the heck is this? Where I'm thinking, are they filming a movie? Am I missing something? These things come in, they slide, slam the brakes on. Mark Johnson gets out of one. Redford gets out of another one. Redford says, Kevin, welcome to L.A. <laughs> It was, it was just, so they were, what did they want you in LA for to finish the movie? We did the party scene where he gets sick and okay. uh, it was only going to be for a week. So I told my principal, I'm going to be gone for about a week. And he says, fine, go, you know? Yeah. Well, all of a sudden, uh, Darren McGavin, the gambler who's, you know, the bookie, his daughter gets sick or something like that. So now it's another week delay. What am I doing? Uh, I got, I got a driver sitting in the Shangri-La hotel across from the uh, Santa Monica pier waiting for me. And I said, you don't have to wait here because my friend was a Buick dealer in Buffalo and Buick was a, a, the uh, Olympic car for 1984, the car of the Olympics. So he lined up a car for me. I got a driver there 
And I said, you know, he says, no, I get paid for being here. I says, well, I got a car, so I, I don't mean to tell you don't take me, but we're going to, my wife and I are going to go, you know, it, it worked out great. Um, and uh, we filmed the scene uh, under the Santa Monica Pier. We filmed the scene uh, on the, uh, the Saint, the, what was the boat? The Queen Mary or something like that. Oh, yeah, the Queen Mary's out in Long Beach. Yeah, we filmed there. And again, I'm not in, I'm those, but I'm there watching. But I was in the party scenes. We filmed that in the Hollywood Hills and set the, the, uh, the caterers set their catering stuff up on what used to be Cecil B. DeMille's home. Wow. So the home we, the home we filmed in was next door to Cecil B. DeMille's. And um, speaking of catering, I'll tell you what, JP, I put 20 pounds on it. <laughs> Every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I'm not talking hot dogs for lunch. I'm talking yeah. the, the the cater. There was amazing. You said you weren't in Buffalo anymore. <laughs> no, that's for sure. But um, one thing that worked for me, um, Mark Johnson, who I got to know very well at the time, um, he he needed he needed a lot of information, and I was the local guy who would get it from. He, who can we get as painters? Where can we go for this? Where we can go for that? He even wanted to know, you know, I had a nice shirt on one day. So where do you get it? I says, O'Connell, Lucas, and Shell. He all of a sudden, where is it? He's buying. He bought me stuff from there. He's buying stuff yeah. from there. Anything they wanted to know, I would let them know. And, so you uh, had a, you had a fix. Uh, they had a fixed War Memorial Stadium up a little bit, right? Yeah, and that's where the painter came in, and the contractors and. Uh, they they got a lot of the the local union guys and everything. Um, they hired some of the Buffalo uh, retired Buffalo police officers as drivers. Um, setting that now, I got to tell you something. That stadium, <clears throat> the third base dugout was just a basic dugout, but they needed a tunnel. They brought uh, they brought these guys in with jackhammers and they took one wall down at the end of the dugout and they went in under the stands pulled all the dirt out, all the stone out. And that was the tunnel that you see Roy Hobbs walking in to the stadium with. And then in, in the movie, if I'm not mistaken, when Glenn Close gives the note to be given to Redford, that's you who delivers the note, right? Yeah. Number, were you number 20? Yep. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Wait, number 20, should I turn around? Can you see it? Hey, you have you have gained twenty pounds. Yeah, <laughs> but anyways, so when we were when I was trying to negotiate and for the guys in the movie, um, I I was talking to Mark Johnson and Barry Levinson, and I said these guys are going to walk. And Barry says, "Well, look, everybody signed the, the they're not going to join uh, SAG Screen right. Actors Guild." And he said, and he said to me, "Look, you've helped us out a lot, and I can't I can't give you a contract." but I'll, I'll give you an important part of the movie. And I says, you know, Barry, I just enjoy this, yeah. whatever you want to do. So when it comes time to uh, once, you know, Glenn Close uh, at the time played, uh, was it Mimo or no, she was a memo. I forget her name again in the movie, but anyways, she, she hasn't told Roy Hobbs that her son is his. Right. Okay. So in the book, Roy Hobbs, he throws the game. Okay. Right. In the movie, the reason he doesn't throw the game is because he finds out he has a son. Right. Okay. And the important part of the movie that Barry Levinson said, I'll give you is he, he called it the uh, turning point of the movie or something like that, where I get the note, Glenn Close gives the cop the note. I get the note from the cop and I give it to Red for or Roy Hobbs and let him know that he has a son. And uh, according to Barry, that was the, you know, the important part of the movie, the movie that he gave me. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty big scene. Yeah, it, it, it was the changing point of the movie. But um, it was, I'll tell you what, it was a great experience. And one thing Caleb Dishonel said to me, if I ever do another baseball movie, you're the first guy I'm calling. Yeah, it's been great, Caleb. Thanks. So I'm in a bullpen for Buffalo in 85. And Mike Bellani, our general manager, comes down and he hands me a note. And I said, what is it? He says, some guy named Caleb called you. 
I says, oh, I said, okay, Caleb Deschanel, right? After the game, I go in the office. Caleb, it's Kevin Lester. Uh, what's up? He says, well, I'm keeping my promise. I go, what's that? He says, I said, if I ever do another baseball movie, you're the first guy I'm calling. I says, really? I says, what do you have? He says, well, it's a Shrewless Joe Jackson story. We don't have a, we don't have a title yet, but it's going to be filmed in Indianapolis in September. Okay. I says, all right. So I go home and tell my wife and she says, oh, you're going to do that again. You know, <laughs> go ahead. I go tell my boss at the high school, well, you know, fall's the busiest time is for athletics. He, he says, go ahead. So I called Caleb up and I says, I'm going to do it. Right. I'm in a bullpen thinking, you know, I got uh, Bob Phelan throwing, you know, stuff at me and I got uh, all these guys and uh, Brian Elkers and I'm sitting there thinking, I already did this. You know what I mean? I can't do this again. So I called Caleb up and I said, look, I appreciate it, but I got a family. Yeah. And I know you tell me it's going to be done just in September. I says, I've been there. It's going to take several months. And how can you top the natural? That Well, it was, it was eight men out, which wasn't that great. Oh, that was a pretty good movie though. Yeah. It, could, it was eight men out. That was and, a pretty uh, good I movie. Didn't do it, but uh, you know what? I was happy with, what I did with the natural, and I will tell you this: it doesn't end. It, um, we've had. Uh, I've even. I'm a right-handed hitter, but the 10th anniversary, they had me at the stadium in Buffalo, batting left-handed. Supposedly, you know, I hit, hit one out left-handed, circle the bases like Roy Hobbs did, and they flashed the lights and everything. Now, if you want to see a bad swing left-handed, <laughs> that might have been the night. It's funny because I I met. Um... Oh, Carlo, uh, Gianni Russo from The Godfather. Oh, okay. He played Carlo. Yeah. He, he told me um, that just that one movie for him has made his whole life. Yeah. He he said, I've been everywhere around the world because of it. I I've have, hadn't had to really work. Yeah. Uh, so it's incredible what some of these, these things do. And obviously you on a lesser note, it's been uh, – you've always got people calling you and asking you about the movie. And I love it. And because of that movie, I caught in the old-timers game in 84, Bill Freehand canceled out. They needed a catcher for the American League. Okay, so I'm going to be the catcher, right? So I I, I say to uh, – uh, okay, I, got, I was interviewed in a dugout by – USA Today was in its infancy, that newspaper. Yep. So, I, so the guy says to me – he says, you know, what are you thinking about and how do you feel? What are your thoughts of being in the dugout and playing in a baseball game with uh, Hall of Famers and future Hall of Famers? And I looked down the end of the dugout and I turned back to him and I said, I feel like the Pope sitting with the 12 apostles. <laughs> and little did I know, the next day there was a picture of Willie Mays batting and me catching in USA Today with that quote. I That's got a cool. call from my friend in Colorado, said, you're not going to believe this. There's a picture of you, and the quote is uh, "Is that. And, you know, over the years, I've uh, I've been interviewed about this and everything, and I've said, you know, I never played Major League Baseball, but a good part of my car career was Major League. You know, but I will tell you this. So I asked – Gene Mock was our skipper for that whole timers game. I go, Skip, now if someone hits a foul ball, what do you just let it go, right? He goes – what the F you talk? You think these guys are going to take it easy on us? You catch everything. And I go, okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I asked the question. So I got, I now I'm a warmer Whitey Ford up and I go, Edward. No, I didn't call him Edward. I go, Whitey. So you're just going to throw fastballs, right? He says, no, if I go like this, I'm going to throw a curve. I'm thinking, these guys are serious, right? <laughs> so I had, I had dinner with him and Bobby Richardson and Moose Scour in the night before. And so I said, all right, so you throw whatever you want. I'll catch it, right? There's a pop-up in a maybe third or fourth inning. There's a pop-up, and I'm thinking, oh, crap, Orlando Cepeda's batting. Oh, crap. So I go, what? I go I'm go. i going to give it an effort, right? Just an effort, right? Moose Scalwin's cheering me on. Lester, go get it. Go get it. I said, hell, I'm going to get this. Kind of a circus catch. I catch it on my way back. Cepeda's pissed off. He says, just so you know, nobody came here to see you catch foul balls. They came, <laughs> they came to see me hit. I, I'll text, I'll send that thing to you later. Oh, that's funny. And I says, I says, Orlando, I says, you got to hit the ball between the white lines. <laughs> you know, my first time up, I hit a foul ball. Matter of fact, Duke McGuire 
and a guy named Pete Weber doing the game. And Duke McGuire said, that's the farthest I've ever seen Lester hit a, a ball. But it was foul. It was off of Warren Spahn. Next pitch throws at me. <laughs> and, and Warren Spahn, is a, he's a New York native, Buffalo area, isn't he? He was, he was from Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I got to – and my father knew him uh, growing up and played against him and everything. Yeah. So I talked to Warren. It, it was just great. But from that movie – there's another thing that happens. Uh, the uh, English teacher at Williamsville South High School, where I was forever, during her film study class, they did The Natural. And she asked me if I would come and speak about it. And I said, definitely. And the kids put questions together. You know, why why did he get shot with this and that? And, uh, and the question, and, and she went to a, a English conference in California. She said, this is what we do. She called me. She said, would you mind if some English teachers around the country contact you? And I says, great. So um, I still have three or four contacting me by way of email. And I limit it to like 10 questions because I'm, you know, I'm not that great yeah. type and everything. And they usually ask questions. You know, why did uh, why did he get shot? And why did, you know, uh, you know, that one, after the whammer struck out, why did uh, Bird, Harriet Bird look at him? And the answer to that is that Barry Levinson <clears throat> wanted the, this movie to be, have somewhat of a take of Greek mythology, where heroes die young. They don't get old and, you know, fragile. Right. This lady, Harriet Bird, the mysterious lady, she was traveling around the country killing the best athletes. They talked about the wrestler, a track and field person. You know, she was killing. They were dying. And, right. and when, when uh, Joe Don Baker or if you want to call him the Whammer and, and Robert Duvall, Max Mercy, this this uh, newspaper guy there and the on the train, they were reading about it, and she was there to kill the Whammer. Right. Well, when Roy Hobbs strikes out the Whammer, her eyes go to Roy Hobbs, and that's why she killed him. That's crazy. And, but there were a lot of things in that movie that uh, Barry Levinson wanted it to be something related to Greek mythology. And, you know, when Red, she asked Redford, you know, about a Homer, he says, he says, why well, she knows who Homer is, but not what a Homer is. Right, right, right. Yeah. But it, it, uh, it's been great. I love it. Um, anytime anyone calls me, I've, I've, I've dealt with uh, Kevin Kiernan. He's done a, a ball nine thing on me at Randall and Kevin Kennedy have done them. A guy named David uh, D'Angelo had a podcast. And, and, and now you're on the brushback with JP. Well, that, that is the best one because I've known, I've known about JP longer than I know about those guys. <laughs> well, Kevin, we cannot thank you enough. This has been unbelievable. It's so good. You know, we could talk movies, we could talk about the whole experience, but obviously, it's it's been something that's had a big impact on your life. Yeah, and you love great. baseball. It comes yeah. out. I'm sure you added so much to the film behind the scenes, and we can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on. Well, it's great, but if you ever want to talk about an official score, because <laughs> Steve Stan, uh, Bob Stanley used to call me the best scorer in the league. Well, Brian you, you must have you must have gave a lot of errors out then. Ste Steamer loved me. Brian Graham, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we're going to let you go. We okay. we appreciate your time. I love the uniform. That is money. Great. That is great. so nice. It was anyway. Great. It Enjoy the rest of your summer. We'll be catching up with you. Good talking to you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Take care. Thanks for having me. Goodbye. Now to wrap up this week's show with the brushback with JP. And uh, JP, what a great guest once again. Uh, what great stories. What a great movie. Uh, so I'm going to go watch it again. Uh, you know what? You just took the words right out of my mouth, John. I am going to go back and watch The Natural just based on knowing some of the things that you can look for now and say, oh, now I know what he was talking about, which is always fun to get the behind the scenes look at at something. And, and one of the most iconic baseball movies uh, ever made. And it was nice for Kevin to share that those stories with us. Great. What a great guy, too. And what great memorabilia he's got from that film. So yeah. uh, wonder back. It was real. Oh yeah, I love. I, I just can't wait to watch the movie again. I'm uh, that's on my list for this week for sure. Uh, well, JP, uh, I just want to let everybody know your social media is the place where you can go see some great content from opinions from JP, clips from this program, clips from JP's announcing and analysis for the Nesson Network. So go and follow JP on X and Instagram at 
I'm going to spell it out for you, R-I-C-C-I-A-R-D-I-J-P. Follow him on both of those platforms. Subscribe to our show uh, on YouTube as well. Just look for The Brush Back with JP. And until next week when we return, this is John Arezzi for JP. Have a great week, everyone.